Hey, I'm Jesse. Let's have a devotion. This passage from Ephesians is so rich. The series is titled For Real This Time. I don't want Easter to merely be a moment or a season for you. I want it to be a new trajectory for your life. So I'm praying over you, Paul's prayers for the church at Ephesus. Here's Ephesians 3, 14 through 19. For this reason, I kneel before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. We talked about this in yesterday's devotion, and now I've got my iPad with me, so I want to zoom in closer on this text, All right? Beginning with these words right here, what does he mean when he says, for this reason? This, this harkens back to what he spoke of in the previous verses, cataloging his sufferings, hoping that these would not be a burden to the church at Ephesus. And then I want us to zoom in on these words right here. Look at this. I kneel before the Father. This is the appropriate way to begin prayer, praising God. The fact that he is kneeling before God indicates that he, as we've seen in the book of Isaiah, knows who God is and is aware of who he is. When you and I are aware of who we are, the only appropriate posture is humility when we know who God is. He is God the Father, from whom every family, you see that? Every family in heaven and on earth is named. I pray that he may grant you, according to the riches of his glory, we talked about that yesterday, to be strengthened with power in your inner being through his spirit. And here's where we pick up. And that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Okay, I don't want this to be a momentary glimpse of heaven. In fact, I believe Hebrews 6 has some alarming words to say for those who just get a glimpse of the power of the age to come, who just taste of the heavenly gift, and then they fall back away to sin. All right, this is bad news. If you are made aware of how amazing the Holy Spirit's presence is and you fall away, you fall back into sin. If there's no repentance in your life, if there's no Holy Spirit's conviction. I've said this over and over again because I want to be very clear about this within the context of this series. Then, man, you're not saved yet. Right now, by the power of the Holy Spirit of God, confess that Jesus is Lord for real this time. You'll know it's for real this time because you're actually going to repent from your sin. Now, he is kneeling before the Father, praying that people will be strengthened by the Holy Spirit to the glory of God, and that Christ may dwell. Okay, to see this word dwell, as in dwelling, as in the place you live. Okay, the Holy Spirit of God is not just visiting your heart. Christ is not just visiting your heart. Look at this. The hope is that Christ would dwell in your heart. He lives there. I know that in, in like the 80s and 90s, it was popular to sort of pray the sinner's prayer. And this is your way of inviting Jesus to live in your heart. Um, this kind of came under fire. It sort of became in vogue as a, uh, as a way to sort of just to be a contrarian and, and pastors sort of, sort of kind of going after the sinner's prayer. And I have also been sort of critical of that language myself. But I have to admit, when I look at, uh, when I look at Ephesians 4, Right here in verse 17, I do see where, where they may have been coming from biblically, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Because if Christ dwells in your heart through faith, this is the moment of salvation. Verse 17 is describing the moment of conversion. I pray that you, being rooted and firmly established in love, see that? May be able to comprehend. We read that yesterday, but I want to I zoom in here on verse 17. This is for real this time, the moment of conversion, because Christ didn't just visit your heart, he dwells there now, right? The idea is that now Christ lives within you, and this changes everything. The moment of conversion is named thus because you have been converted. The old has gone the new has come. The old you is dead, and you are now risen to walk in new life in Christ, because Christ dwells right there in your heart, at the very core of your being. 
We are saved by grace through faith. And this is not of ourselves. It is a gift of God. So what he's praying for in verse 17, in the beginning of verse 17, is for conversion. He's, he's, first of all, he's praying that the church at Ephesus would be comprised of people who are truly Christians, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. I pray that you, being rooted and firmly established in love, this is really cool. It's not just that love would be something that you pay homage to, but that you would be rooted at the very basis of who you are. Everything comes back to love. Peter would pray something similar for the persecuted Christians throughout Rome in AD 64. In Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Bithynia, and Asia, he was praying for these residents of modern-day Turkey, then under the, under the power of the, of, the, of the Roman Empire, led by Nero, who was burning Christians. His prayer was that they would love one another deeply or earnestly, as some translations render it, uh, so, so that you, you, may be, you may love one another deeply because love covers a multitude of wrongs. And as you're walking in fellowship with, with Christ for real this time as a part of the church, guess what, man? You're going to need a lot of love and you're, you're going to need to show a lot of love because the people in your church are imperfect just like you. But love is going to cover a multitude of those wrongs. This, the reason that there are multiple translations of this word from 1 Peter that echoes what Paul is writing right here about being rooted and established in love, the reason there are multiple translations is because the English rendering of it is awkward. What he's conveying through the Greek word is actually like, uh, like this craning of the neck. You know, when you're like, hey, look at that eagle. Oh, wait, I don't see it. And you do this and then you, oh, I can see it now. It, he's conveying like love one another, uh, like earnestly, deeply, from the heart, because love covers a multitude of wrongs. According to our text, Paul is praying the same thing for the church at Ephesus, that you be rooted and firmly established. Look at the emphasis he's using here, okay? You can't just check the love box, and you can't just use the word in empty fashion, in rote delivery. It's got to be genuine, and it's got to be at the very root of everything you do, rooted and firmly established in love. I pray that you, being rooted and firmly established in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the length, width, height, and depth of God's love. And we'll continue with the remainder of this verse tomorrow. I pray this has been a blessing to you. I'll see you tomorrow.